Hey everyone, today we're going to be talking about the unit circle, namely how to build it from scratch and how we can use it to start looking at trig ratios as functions. Let's start with some motivation. Say that I have a circle on the xy plane that has a radius of 1. Therefore, the circle we know has points 1, 0, 0, 1, negative 1, 0, and 0, negative 1. Rather, these are the points where our circle is intersecting with the x or y axis. But a natural question to ask is if I have another point on this circle, say x and y, what can we say about this point? Since the unit circle can be seen as a circle of radius 1 sitting in the xy plane, we're essentially trying to gauge which points actually sit exactly one unit away from the origin. Well, we can start answering this question using some trig. What I'm going to do is inscribe this circle with a triangle. The hypotenuse of the triangle will start from the origin and then end up at our point x and y that I've drawn here. Again, the line that I've drawn from the origin to the point x and y has length 1 because this is a circle of radius 1. The thing is we know a little bit more about this triangle. We actually know the length of the sides of this triangle. The horizontal line of this triangle will have length x, and the vertical line of this triangle will have length y. Now I'm going to inscribe the angle theta sitting right next to the origin. So the triangle that we've inscribed here is going to allow us to use trig ratios to make some deductions. We can observe that sine of theta is equal to y over 1, cosine of theta is equal to x over 1, and tangent of theta is equal to y over x. So we can realize our point xy as trig ratios of this inscribed angle theta. Having a hypotenuse of 1 is making the math just a little bit easier because our trig ratios can be looked as solid numbers instead of quotient. So throughout this process, when we want points on the unit circle, we can appeal to triangles within that unit circle, particular angles theta, which are the ones next to the origin, and then we can realize the points on this unit circle as trig ratios of one angle. Let's set up some standard convention about the angles. If our angle starts on the right part of the x-axis and travels in a counterclockwise position, our angle theta is going to be positive. Think of it like this. The first time that you ever saw a number line, you were told that moving to the right gave you larger numbers and moving to the left gave you smaller or negative numbers. That's essentially the convention that we're setting up here. Traveling counterclockwise gives us a positive angle. Now suppose that an angle tau is going in the clockwise direction. We would say that tau is negative. When looking at the unit circle, our angles are going to be expressed in one of two ways, degrees or radians. We'll talk about what these mean in a later slide. Basically, they're two languages, so to speak, in a way of representing angles. And you can always convert from one form to the other, which is given by these pretty simple formulas. If I have an angle in degrees and I'm converting it to radians, I multiply that number by pi over 180. And if I have an angle in radians and I'm converting it to degrees, I multiply the angle by 180 over pi. Again, we'll talk about this in more detail in a later slide. Let's go ahead and start filling in the circles with some common information. We're going to start with the first quadrant of this circle, in other words, this upper right hand slice. Remember that our point xy can be represented by cosine of theta and sine of theta for the same theta. We're going to start inscribing our unit circle with special right triangles. These special right triangles are going to give us what are known as the common angles and the common points on the unit circle. In other words, these are going to be the common angles and the common points on the unit circle that you're generally asked to learn in an algebra class. But instead of just memorizing, we're going to view a more constructive process. The first inscribed angle I'm going to look at is 30 degrees lifted off of the x-axis. Lifting off the x-axis by 30 degrees will inscribe us with the special right triangle, the 30-60-90 triangle. Recall that if my hypotenuse has length 1, then my sides are going to be 1 half and root 3 over 2. Notice that the upper right point of this triangle is touching the unit circle, so to find out what that point is exactly, all we have to do is compute the trig ratios of 30 degrees. Since we already know the sides of this triangle, we know that cosine of 30 degrees is equal to root 3 over 2, and sine of 30 degrees is equal to 1 half. Therefore, this special right triangle makes contact with the unit circle at the point root 3 over 2, 1 half. So at this point, we found our first point of the unit circle and the rest are going to be constructed in essentially the same manner. If I look at the angle lifted off of the x-axis by 45 degrees, I can inscribe the 45-45-90 triangle. This will have sides root 2 over 2, root 2 over 2, and a hypotenuse of 1. Therefore, looking at the trig ratios, I get that cosine of 45 degrees is equal to root 2 over 2, and sine of 45 degrees is equal to root 2 over 2. 
Therefore, this special right triangle makes contact with the unit circle at the point root 2 over 2, root 2 over 2. The last point of this quadrant, I lift off the x-axis by 60 degrees, and I use the same special right triangle to see that this makes contact with the unit circle at the point 1 half, root 3 over 2. Something to notice here, if I don't lift off the x-axis at all, the point that I'm sitting at is the point 1, 0, where the unit circle intersects with the x-axis. And if I lift off the x-axis by 90 degrees, the point in contact is going to be the point 0, 1, which is the y-intercept of the unit circle. So now that the first quadrant of this unit circle is filled in, I can start taking some shortcuts. In this first quadrant, I know that all of my values are going to be positive. But if I start shifting into other quadrants, what's going to happen is the only thing that will change about these points is the sign. So for starters, what if I lift off the x-axis by 120 degrees? This is going to put us in the second quadrant while all of my x-coordinates are negative but my y-coordinates are positive. But this point on the unit circle sits directly across from the point 1 half root 3 over 2, which corresponds to the 60 degree lift. So all I have to do is take the point 1 half root 3 over 2 and change the sign of the x-coordinate but leave everything else the same. This means that at 120 degrees, the point on the unit circle corresponding to that angle is negative 1 half root 3 over 2. So really, all I have to do is take the remaining points in the first quadrant and flip them about the y-axis and then change the sign of the x-coordinate. Therefore, my points will reveal as such, and then my inscribed angles will be 120, like we just did, 135, 150, and then 180 degrees. When I move into the third quadrant, I realize that both the x and y coordinates have to be negative, so I can again appeal to the first quadrant, and then just flip the points about the x and y axis simultaneously, and then change the signs of both the points. So at 210 degrees, I get negative root 3 over 2, negative 1 half. At 225 degrees, I get negative root 2 over 2, negative root 2 over 2. At 240 degrees, I get negative 1 half, negative root 3 over 2. And then at 270 degrees, I get 0, negative 1. Moving to the last quadrant, I again look at the first quadrant, and I change all the signs of the y coordinates. This means at 300 degrees, I get 1 half, negative root 3 over 2. At 315 degrees, I get root 2 over 2, negative root 2 over 2. At 330, I get root 3 over 2, negative 1 half. And then at 360, I get 1, 0, back to the start. And that's essentially how you build the unit circle. Look at the first quadrant and use special right triangles, and then just make deductions about the signs of the points to get the rest. All the angles here are known as common angles of the unit circle, and all the points here can be known as common points of the unit circle. And the main use of the circle is to help us start evaluating trig functions. And by trig functions, I mean a function that inputs a real number and then outputs a real number. As a quick for instance, we're going to calculate cosine of 45 degrees. So what we do is we look for the inscribed 45 degree angle, look at the corresponding point, and then look at the x-coordinate at that point because that is what cosine calls for. When we look at this, the corresponding point is root 2 over 2, root 2 over 2, both positive. Therefore, the x-coordinate is equal to root 2 over 2, and we're done. Similarly, one can deduce that sine of 270 degrees is equal to negative 1 because it corresponds to the point 0, negative 1. So at the moment, we've been talking about everything in terms of degrees, and I've been promising to talk about these things called radians. Now the radian is a unit of angular measure, which is essentially just another way to talk about angles, but in a different language, so to speak. Now let's talk about how a radian is defined, and the easiest way to do this is to visualize it with the unit circle. Suppose that I have lifted off the x-axis in such a way that the arc length going from this particular line that's lifted to the x-axis is a length of 1. The corresponding angle that's needed to do this is set to be exactly 1 radian. To get an angle that measures as 2 radians, I lift off the x-axis in such a way that I get an arc length of 2. To get an angle of 3 radians, I lift off the x-axis in such a way to get an arc length of 3. Now something interesting is that this arc length of 3 wasn't long enough to actually get around the entire semicircle. I'm missing a little bit of distance here. It turns out that the angle that I would have to lift to get all the way across the circle, which translates to 180 degrees, 
is actually pi radians. And remember, pi is this number 3.14 and so on and so forth that never ends. So here we have our first translation between radians and degrees. 180 degrees is equal to pi radians. Now every time you see a circle, or at least a circle in a math class, the number pi is bound to show up. And that's essentially just what happened here. We are now going to be describing our angles in terms of pi, instead of numbers between 0 and 360. But since I just drew the unit circle entirely out of degrees, I want to know how to convert to radians. The conversion to radians is done by a simple formula. I take the angle written in terms of degrees and I multiply it by the number pi over 180. Think of this as you're inserting the pi part of the radian and you're deleting the angle part, which is 180. Like I said, our first translation was saying that 180 degrees corresponded to pi radians, and when you multiply this out, that's exactly what you get. As another example, 45 degrees in radians comes out to be pi over 2. Now this wouldn't be too efficient if I couldn't work backwards. So if I want to convert from radians to degrees, I multiply the angle by 180 over pi. So pi over 3 radians translates to 60 degrees, and 2 pi over 3 radians translates into 120 degrees. So I'll take a shortcut and sort of fast track all of the conversions here but I'm going to draw our unit circle just as it was in the previous slide and convert all angles into radians. So I'll start with 30 degrees. If I convert 30 degrees into radians, I get a result of pi over 6. Therefore, the angle pi over 6 corresponds to 30 degrees. And if I do this with all angles in the unit circle, I get our common radian angles for the unit circle. Now talking about angles in the unit circle in terms of radians is much more conventional, so you're much more likely to see the unit circle in terms of radians instead of degrees. But this does not interfere with our trig ratios. The trig functions actually don't care what language you're using to talk about angles. All it cares about is that you're giving it an angle and it gives you a corresponding x or y coordinate. For starters, we'll compute cosine of pi over 3 and look at the corresponding angle and realize that we get an answer of 1 half. Sine of 3 pi over 4 gives us root 2 over 2. Cosine of pi is going to give us negative 1. And then tangent of 11 pi over 6, by definition, is sine 11 pi over 6 over cosine 11 pi over 6. So we look at the corresponding point, divide the y coordinate by the x coordinate, simplify to get negative root 3 over 3. So the unit circle definitely does have a lot of information. Like I said before, the easiest way to start from scratch, if you can't remember, is to use special right triangles. But it's also very handy to have a copy of the unit circle with you if you're doing assignments or homework. I took a picture of a unit circle out of a textbook in 2013, and I still have it in my phone, and I still use it. I even use it to make this video. Let's go ahead and talk about some examples. Let's evaluate cotangent 11 pi over 6. And recall that cotangent is equal to adjacent over opposite of that angle, which in our case is just x over y. And if we look at the x coordinate over the y coordinate of this corresponding angle, we get root 3 over 2 divided by negative 1 half, which simplifies to negative root 3. When evaluating sine of 3 pi over 2, this is just the y coordinate of that corresponding angle, which is negative 1. Tangent of 90 degrees is equal to tangent of pi over 2 when we convert to radians, which is the y coordinate over the x coordinate, which comes out to be 1 over 0. But we can't divide by 0, so that actually tells us that tangent of 90 degrees or tangent of pi over 2 is undefined. So as a trigonometric function, 90 degrees or pi over 2 radians are not in the domain of tangent of theta. Next we'll convert 24 degrees to radians. Multiplying by pi over 180 and simplifying, we get 15 pi over 12. Last, if I want to convert 5 pi to degrees, multiply by 180 over pi to get an answer of 540 degrees, which is like going around the unit circle more than once. For our last example, we'll compute cosecant of 7 pi over 4 plus tangent of 3 pi over 4. The definition of cosecant is 1 over sine, so when we compute sine of 7 pi over 4, we get negative root 2, and when we compute tangent of 3 pi over 4, we get negative 1. Therefore, our final answer is negative root 2 minus 1.